Good afternoon. I'm Emma, and I'm going to be telling you how snails can teach women a lot. Now, I wish I could say it was a pleasure to be talking to you today, but the fact is I've been so nervous, I nearly backed out of this several times. But a woman offering to do a talk about ambition and then backing out... <laughs> it's not such a great look, so here I am. Now, why did I get interested in ambition? Well, it's been building for the last decade throughout my 20s. Because as a journalist, as a broadcaster, I've been trying to do well. I've been trying to do things. And every time I've done something, whether it's launching a section at a newspaper or taking on a new show at a radio program, I have felt that people have gone, colleagues, loved ones, Emma, wow, God, you're so ambitious. Great. Really ambitious. Wow. And that's lovely. But it's made me feel a bit odd at times, a bit like I shouldn't be like that. And at the same time, I've been growing up, besides my husband, who I love very much, he's been my boyfriend for the majority of my 20s till we got married, and he's been doing amazing things. He's been starting companies with his brother, he's been doing very well in the corporate world. And they've said, congratulations, well done. But they haven't gone, you're so ambitious. <laughs> so I started thinking, is a lack of ambition what's creating gender in inequality? We know that women aren't where they should be, at the top of governments or the top of corporate ladders. We know all of that. And actually, that's what I thought I was going to come here and say today. I thought I was going to say to you, it's down to us. We just don't have enough ambition. We don't have the same as men. We're not leaning in as much as we should. And we have all know where that comes from, the woman at the top of Facebook. But it's just not true. It's not true that women don't have the same level of ambition as men. It's a myth. So what is it then? Well, before I tell you, I want to say a couple of things. Throughout this talk, I am not going to mention two words specifically. And you'll find out why, and you can think about what they might be, and I'll tell you at the end. The other thing is, I wanted to say a little bit about who's giving this talk and who it's for. Normally, when women talk about ambition, they are over the age of 40, they're very rich, they run companies and governments. I've done none of that. I'm 30. I don't have that much dosh. And I'm pretty much at the beginning still of my career of being a journalist and a broadcaster and whatever's next. This is a talk for regular women. This is a talk for women who may want to become a CEO, who may not be. But my ambition for this talk is to try and help women play leading roles in their own lives, crucially at home and at work. So what are these things? Now, before, before I go into this, and bear with me, I just want to tell you a little story. A few weeks ago, I went on a journalistic project. I was making a radio program to visit a factory. And I met some women who turn out pots all day, every day. I took them each into a room and spoke to them about their conditions. And I said to them, are you treated, are you paid equally to men? Yes. Do you do similar hours to men? Yes. Are you into women's rights? No, don't be daft. And then I knew I was back up north and I felt at home where I'm from, Manchester. And then I said to them, are you equal to men? No, of course we're not. Our voices just aren't heard like the men's. Men run the company. We're just not valued in that way. Now, I'm going to argue to you today that that has a cumulative effect. I want to show you this quote. It's a favorite quote of mine. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking that they don't have any. So what are these things? They're invisible. You can't see them. You can't smell them. You can't touch them. You can't hear them. They are invisible barriers. And what I want to do in this talk is I want to highlight what I think those are using my own experiences and using my friends' experiences and people I've read about. Because what I want to show to you is without realizing it, all too often, Women lose custody of their ambition. <laughs> okay? As a journalist, I reserve the right to quote myself. <laughs> just, just once. I've split them out into handy four sections. Let's start with poisonous presumptions. Now, when I was researching this, I was astonished and rejoicing to find that people far cleverer than me have named this phenomenon in the workplace. 
and it's called second generation gender bias. A way this manifests itself is basically women are still judged in the workplace, but covertly, subtly, based on very deep cultural expectations of how women are meant to be. The features of leadership are very male, and that's how people view them. Being outspoken, being assertive, saying the things nobody wants to hear. Women are expected to be caring, to be sweet, and importantly, to be liked. They are not liked when they show the same characteristics as men and go after the same goals. So if they do progress, they have to trade that off. It's actually called the dominance penalty. Another presumption is that women are not as invested in their careers as men. This comes out much more when they have children or when they have to go off and care for a sick relative, which often falls to women, all too often. There is an idea that they don't want the big jobs anymore, so guess what? They don't get given them anymore. It's a vicious circle. Robin Eli, a professor at the Harvard Business School with her colleagues, commissioned a survey of 25,000 students. Most of it sort of split 50-50 between men and women. Guess how many women were out doing full-time childcare of this hugely successful group? Full-time, only 11%. Guess what percentage wanted to be doing it full-time? A minority. They had le they'd left reluctantly. They weren't being given the same opportunities anymore to the poisonous presumption. This is a poisonous presumption that they don't want to be there anymore. So if you don't get given the big jobs, how do you proceed? The other poisonous presumption is that women's work, women's jobs, whatever you want that to be, are worth less. I was astounded to find an example from 2011 of a discrimination case in Birmingham. 174 women took their case, they took their former employer, Birmingham City Council, they were cooks, cleaners, and carers, because they realized that the men who were at the same grade as them had been able to go forward for bonuses. Those men, same grade, they were refuse workers, and they were street cleaners. Women's work, men's work, same level. To put this into picture for you, one man earned 52,000 pounds that year. The woman took home less than 12,000. Birmingham City Council are still appealing the fact that they have to pay out, wait for it, 575 million pounds in what should have paid to women at the same level as these men. Nice guy misogyny. Let's talk about that. We all know them. They're some of the loveliest men I meet. So who are they and what do they mean? A study was done in 2012 by social scientists that looked at men who had traditional stay-at-home wives and men who had wives who went out to work like them and tried to analyze whether those men then treated their female colleagues differently as a result of their home experience. They did. You can't see this stuff. You're not in their crew and you don't know why, but here's why. Those men who have stay-at-home wives, they like women, but they just don't want to promote them. They said that those women wouldn't be the ones that they would pick for promotion, the women around them, and they also said that companies that were run predominantly by women weren't as good. No one tells you that that's what they're thinking. But it's there. Dumb denial, arguably one of the worst, because this is women being complicit. We go on and on, let's get more women at the top, let's get more women running companies. Is it any good if they just do what the men do and they continue to perpetuate the same cultural assumptions about women? I'll give you another story. A friend of mine recently joined a company in the city. And when she joined, she was astonished to find fresh out of her master's course, very enthusiastic, we all remember it. <laughs> she was astonished to find that at every level, majority were men. Every level, from the beginning. So, in her enthusiasm, she took out a group of women from the partner level down to her level. And she said, what's going on here? Is it the recruitment? I just really want to understand. And they all stared at her blankly and said, we don't know what you're talking about. There's no problem. So she keeps digging, and she feels more and more like she's being a victim, and she really isn't enjoying this experience, so she just shuts up. 
And then right at the end, the most senior woman, the female partner, goes, I do sometimes think about the fact that it's interesting that all of the women who work here are extremely beautiful. <laughs> Go figure. Let's think about who's hiring, and let's think about why they're hiring, and let's think about why there's a smaller number. Remember, I'm telling you invisible barriers that lead to women losing custody of their ambition. Final one. I'm the guiltiest of this, the imitation game. I believe we've made so much progress at work, but we've made so little at home. And that's because we aren't thinking about the jobs that we do and the jobs that men do. Because guess what? We want to imitate what our mothers did. We want to be how our grandmas were, all while having a full-time job and lots of ambition. And we don't try and renegotiate that. So with me, when I got married, my husband's also a very good cook, we both enjoy it. He used to go out and say to people, yeah, we both cook the same amount. And it was like a spear through my heart. I was like, no, I do more of it. Because my mother made every single meal when I was growing up, and I felt like that was a failing. It wasn't helped, and I've asked her permission to share this story, with my mother's facial reaction when she used to come around for dinner, and my mum would say, who cooked this beautiful meal? And if it wasn't me, she would go, oh. <laughs> How very interesting. She doesn't do that anymore. I want to return to those factory women, because there's a particular story there that stays with me. One woman I met, two children, husband who's a builder, he earns slightly more than her. She makes 3,000 teapots a day. 3,000. She gets up at 5 a.m., makes the breakfast, makes the packed lunch for everyone, preps the dinner, takes the children to school, goes to the factory at lunchtime, goes to get her other child, who's at a special needs school, goes back to the factory, comes back, picks them up, makes the dinner, and at 9 o'clock at night, and I noticed she had very toned arms, she goes training, physical training. And I said to her, wow, and she's like, it's all my choice, it's what I want. Very arrogantly, I'll contend that it's not her choice, it's what she thinks is her choice, because she told me proudly it's how her mother ran her home. And I'll contend this even further. She could change her family's bottom line economically if she could have a bit more time to complete her personal training qualification, which she told me privately that she wanted to do. When is she ever going to do that anytime soon while she's doing this double shift at home and imitating the life that came before her? Again, an invisible barrier that she hasn't realized is leading to her losing custody of her own ambition. And that ambition could change the financial prospects for that little family. So, we're going to come to him. At the beginning of this talk, I said to you, I wasn't going to mention two words. Here they are. Sexism and feminism. I didn't want to put anyone off. Because <laughs> guess what? I want people who don't associate with those words to watch this. A man from the House of Lords said to me at a dinner recently, which I was hosting a media event, very honestly, he said to me, sexism isn't dead. Men have just learned how to hide it so much better. So what can we do about these invisible barriers? Well, first of all, I hope I've highlighted some of them. So now women can think about them. They can think, what's actually going on here that might be stopping me? Secondly, I want you and anybody else who has a relationship at home to think about, and I don't just mean with a man or a woman, I mean with kids and everything, to regularly revisit that social contract that you have and see if you can negotiate a better deal, a better arrangement that might work. And here's the other thing. The reason I've brought up feminism is because supposedly we're in a fourth wave, whatever you want to call it, the latest version of feminism. While I like it, and while I write about it and talk about it, we've been at such pains to decontaminate the word feminism, to make it funny, to make it warm, to make it appealing that I think it is letting women become complacent. The guards are down. 
The sexism of today, the discrimination of today, whatever you want to call it, and even if it's not malintentioned from men and from women, it doesn't come with a slap on the arse and, hi, sweetheart. It doesn't come with that. It's subtle. We are sleepwalking into inequality and to losing what we really need, which is to be able to play leading roles in our own lives. So what can we learn from snails? I hear you cry. <laughs> this guy can't see very well, so he's grown these. Evolution. And I'm not proposing that for any second, I mean, I do have some glasses. But women need to grow something, OK? <laughs> and it ain't balls. <laughs> they need to detect the stuff that is eating away at some of their original goals, at some of their original dreams, at that North Star that they really wanted to achieve, whether that is at home or at work. Because these are the things that no one is going to shake you and say, where'd it go? Only you can do that, and you need to do it with an extra layer or tentacles or whatever this is, because you need to detect it. But I do have some good news, okay? I don't like to leave people feeling bad, apart from growing tentacles or whatever else we can grow. If you're sitting here, if you're watching this, and you're thinking, well, I have lost custody of my ambition. I did want to do that thing, and I haven't done it. Guess what? The great thing about it is you can always, always get custody back. Thank you.